Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I'm delighted to be joined by English teacher Jenny Webb. Jennifer, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, how are you? Hello, I'm well, thanks. Thank you for having uh, me. Uh, let me just start off with the, the simple one. Could I get you to introduce yourself to our listeners and tell everybody what you do? Yeah, so um, I am an English specialist at uh, secondary. Um, I've been teaching about, what, 13 years, and I'm an assistant principal for teaching and learning at a really phenomenal school in Wakefield, which is in West Yorkshire, whoop, whoop, um, called <laughs> Academy Cathedral. Um, so I lead on teaching and learning and uh, literacy and line managed English. But I was Right, we get... We get sound effects as well for the phenomenal. So what, what makes it phenomenal? Uh, the, the school. Um, yeah. It really is, so I've worked in five secondary schools now, and I cannot tell you how wonderful this school is. It's one of those places where, like, without... I'm a bit of a dramatic person, um, so I do tend to exaggerate, but I'm certainly not exaggerating in this case. I mean, they won the Times Ed Secondary School of the Year in 2019 for just being having the most wonderful culture that just permeates every mm. single corridor every single classroom and i've been there for a few months i've recently moved and honestly just have never been somewhere with such mm -hmm. absolutely phenomenal kind of basically fundamental values um inform every single decision they make from you know and the the cleaners can tell you what the school values are um, okay, so we know um, we know a, a building doesn't make a school, and if we lifted everyone out of the school and moved them somewhere else, w w could you bottle that culture? What yeah. you know, that's that's the winning formula for us all, is it? So what what are the hallmarks of that phenomenal culture? Well, I think so. We always say this; it sounds really naff, but it's true. Every school has their little mottos, but this one really yeah. matters. So we talk about every student, every lesson, every day. And we talk about how everything is possible for one who believes it's a it's a C of E school um, it has mm -hmm. a really, like kind of um, really important um, Christian um, faith kind of guiding its work. But essentially that just translates into kind of good old socialism and looking after each other and all that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, we have a, quite an old building that we're dealing mm -hmm. with. You know, it's not one mm -hmm. of these fancy new builds. They have, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter that the building is sort of not ideal and that we're sort Does of- the, the rain mm -hmm. drop through the roof when it pours down yeah, still? absolutely, absolutely. But the point is the, it, it, it's the people. The people are just the most friendly, happy, upbeat, kind of positive staff I've ever worked with. And the head mm -hmm. is leading that in this really really impressive. so um Great. i'm a little biased but i know you've got the best job you can have in a school leading teaching <laughs> and learning of others and i can oh, see I that ev yeah and i can see that evident in your blog and books and all sorts of things and that's what tends to happen with people that drive this stuff so culture phenomenal school you're doing the best job so you know, without putting you on a pedestal, uh, you, you're kind of in a position where you've got the best conditions, I suppose, to really transform classroom culture. So give me a, a sense of where you or your school is at in terms of the classroom day to day business. So, I mean, really strong. Obviously, we've had I, I certainly don't want to. I hate the narrative around COVID and how it, it kind of, you know, this but covid and all the kind of excuses everyone's had a really hard year in education in general i know mm -hmm. having been in another school during covid as well that that's been challenging in different ways for different schools depending on what the cohort is um mm -hmm. right teaching and learning is the best job in any school i am absolutely i'm so fortunate to be where i am and have the role that i've got um and i think that what's really interesting in my current school in terms of the challenge and what we're seeing is what's always been going on in classrooms certainly for the last four or five years has been incredibly strong mm -hmm. so really really strong kind of there's no firefighting i've worked i've been an assistant head for teaching and learning in previous um school um and while that was a great role and the staff were great and you know you learn a lot and you achieve things um a very very different environment because essentially that was firefighting a lot of the time like a very different context very very different um can uh, i uh, put you on a spot what what causes what causes the firefighting i think the I honestly forces? Think it's a lack of strategic vision from the top i think it's mm -hmm. kind of a, what we're doing all the time when we're firefighting in, in kind of ri schools is reacting to things all the time and we're not getting ahead of it and being proactive and so when 
even if we do sit down and set a vision and decide what we want to see, what those schools do that continue to firefight despite the vision is that they don't then use that vision to inform their decision making. Mm -hmm. You have a really challenging decision to make. So, for example, your vision should enable you to make really difficult decisions because mm -hmm. you go back to it and say, this is hard. That option's also hard. But what's our vision? What do we really want to get out of this? And how, you know, which decision does that mean we have to make mm -hmm. if that's the difficult one? So um, I'm going to put you in another spot. Yeah. Um, could you take your staff from your other school and put them into the current one? Would it change the culture or not? What do you mean? Or, like physically? Would you, would you like, still get the same performance levels in the school, which is performing at a phenomenal level? Well, with but but i think it's it's a nonsense argument to suggest that you can move staff from one school quote unquote and put them in another school the staff are the school aren't they doesn't matter yeah. where the staff are my staff right now could go and teach those kids in a car park and the standards would still be really high it doesn't make any difference it's not the staff at my previous school were great they really really like they worked hard they had the right intentions they didn't have the right structures in place and they didn't have the mm -hmm. right leadership in place and that's not an individual slight against anyone that's just mm -hmm. a, that's my observation that mm -hmm. Basically, a leadership team's job is to set the weather and then take away as many obstacles as they possibly can so that the teaching staff can just teach really well. And mm -hmm. that's what my current school gets right. You know, we are, it's like service-based leadership. We're supporting the curriculum leaders who have the hardest job in the world and the subject teachers just do their job. And like that, that's, that's gravy. That's my job as head of teaching and learning um, or part of the teaching and learning team is essentially to just make everyone else's job as easy as possible <laughs> and make them really good at it and identify when they have training needs and make sure they get it, that, you know, to a higher level. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm pushing you. I, I like these answers. This is kind of the, the, the push that teaching and learning leads need. Um, I might come back to this topic. Uh, now, we've got a few listeners from different international settings. We've had a whoop whoop already. And we've had a, we've had a, a, a northern that's gravy. Could you explain what that's gravy that's means? Gravy. Um, basically, in Yorkshire, we really like gravy. Gravy, for people <laughs> who aren't aware, is like a delicious sauce made of meat juices. Uh, you can have vegetarian gravy, um, but essentially... <laughs> That's poured crazy. over chips <laughs> <laughs> all over everything put gravy on everything basically yeah we 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 we, we have a lot of gravy in the so south, you're a gravy on chips girl i'm a gravy on everything kind of girl do you know what okay. in the south they'd call it joux but what they really mean joux. is gravy but not enough gravy, gravy. Yeah. i like that i like that uh having returned to the north after 30 years seconded down south um right uh, Jenny, on your blog, uh, which I'm having a little nose through, it says you're a teacher, leader, author, blogger, and speaker. Which one do you do best and which one do you do worst? If I'm honest, I think all of it is teaching, really, through various mediums. I think that the reason that my books have resonated on my blogs have resonated with people is uh -huh. that all I'm doing is kind of explaining things in quite a straightforward way i think that's that's what's been really interesting about the feedback for the metacognition book because mm -hmm. what a lot of people have said is oh i didn't really understand it but now i really understand it and that that was my 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 mission because it's just everyone's a bit scared because it's a big word and i'm an english yeah. teacher. teaching big words is what i'm good at so that's making the complex <laughs> simple yeah, yeah, yeah keep it simple you're always yeah. onto a winner um, right. make it concrete Excellent. Now, I'm going to come back to all your books and blogs and things, but I'm just going to go to a couple of questions that I always ask uh, podcast uh, people. Uh, first question is, could you describe your 16-year-old self? What were you like at school? I was a massive dweeb. Um, <laughs> basically, like all, in all seriousness, um, I had quite a difficult teenage life um, yeah. for various reasons. Um, so I was... People premium, single parent family, all those things. But we also had um, like a social worker and there were lots of challenging things going on, let's say, um, mm -hmm. my childhood. And so mm -hmm. school for me was very much a safe space. Um, mm -hmm. I absolutely loved school. Like in the summer holidays, I would volunteer to go into the library and help the librarian sort out the book. That's the kind of thing it was. I was absolutely like, I was just infuriatingly, grossly smart and obsessed with school. It was, it was my entire life. So I was either doing extra homework, doing extra reading in the library, in the music department, or going to orchestra practice. Like that uh -huh. was my entire life. Um, yeah, I, I just loved it. And I think that 
that's a I, I totally embrace that part of myself and I think what's really important for students in particular like I talk about geeks ruling the world and about yeah. geek and about totally owning that weird bit of yourself so I'm a medievalist that's my my degree is in medieval English literature and language fantastic so I'm like old Norse and Anglo-Saxon and I love that stuff and I play the bassoon and that's weird well I totally stepped into that and great geek, you know, and have made so it, so. when did when did the teacher conversation start where did that start the teacher so i told my mum for ages that i would definitely study medicine and then i told her i don't want to study medicine but i will study law and then i told her let me study english at uni and then i will do a law conversion and then when i finished my finals i told her i had a place on a pgce course that's kind of how that went i think i always <laughs> I wanted to be a teacher always but, um, Great. I just had to fit, ease my mum into that. She's totally okay with it now. It's taken a while. Good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what a great story. Um. <laughs> so after school, uh, PG, you know, university PGCE. Just give us a quick uh, kind of overview. Where where was that? What happened? Yeah. Um. I went to a, a comp, like an all girls comp in East Leeds, which was pretty rough brilliant mm -hmm. school for me they did absolutely they, they did great work for me um but they had like a 12 and a half percent GCSE pass rate or something when I did my GCSEs I stayed there at A-level and had amazing A-level teachers to be fair like absolutely mm -hmm. top draw A-level teachers yeah. um I swear my history teacher like made me want to be a teacher she was an amazing woman Miss Batty what a legend um but I went on to read English at Oxford um, at Merton College, um, which was amazing. Just like mm -hmm. such an experience. I felt very Northern all of a sudden and um, like my accent got broader. <laughs> yeah, I bet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, absolutely. The most incredible three years of my life and totally uh -huh. opened, opened myself up. And do you know and PGCE? What? Yeah, PGCE at Leeds. Yeah. Okay. Came back home for my PGCE. Great. Um, so how, and I noticed you've been blogging for, I think your blog goes back to 2013. You had a little gap in between, I suspect, uh, children and job and life gets in yeah. the way here or there. Yeah. And I think like sometimes I think it's really important, especially when people start a blog as well, to remember that your blog doesn't own you and you don't have to blog every week, blog when you have something to say. And I think I just stopped having something to say for a little while, but that's, that's fine. Well, I'm in trouble because <laughs> uh, that, that's good food for thought for myself, I suppose, with the amount of stuff I'm putting out. Maybe I should keep quiet for a little it's while. All good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, g give me a little journey in terms of your school leadership career. When did the kind of, t always leading teaching and learning or have you done a few other things? Yeah, I was in, um, I was, uh, after being a normal English teacher, I moved to become an, an advanced skills teacher moved into lead practitioner basically the same job but once AST was scrapped um, and then I was a head of English in mm -hmm. uh, Bradford and then I moved to be an AP teaching and learning and then I've got another AP teaching and learning with research lead at my current place so kind of stepped up the pretty traditional route really head of mm -hmm. yeah great uh, and and kind of give us um you know a bit of leadership wisdom give me some of the things that you've learned what to do what not to do Oh, I don't know. Um, I think it's different for everybody, isn't it? Because it totally depends what your it is. are. Well, let, let, let's zoom it in a little bit. Let's let's say I'm a struggling NQT and I'm in your last school and another struggling NQT in your current school. What kind of words of wisdom would you, you know, just for general classroom oh, management or well, behaviour problems or? Well, in general, it's, it's all about consistency and all about remembering. And I, I would give the same advice, whichever school you're in, if I'm honest, because mm -hmm. there's very little that an NQT can do to change what's going on in the wider school. They, they really aren't in a, in a powerful position. And I always say to NQTs, have a notepad and write down all the things you will never do when you're a leader, <laughs> because that helped me get through for a long yes, time. Yes, it is good advice. Yeah, but I think um, the most important thing to remember is that great teaching doesn't happen in a lesson nobody learns anything in a 50 minute lesson or an hour long lesson that that is that's ridiculous nonsense so all you need to do is turn up every day and do a decent job every day be predictable be consistent be mm. solid don't try to wipe yourself out making card sorts and stupid things like that it's uh some it's some very good advice and i think you know for for listeners uh 
you know, having relocated from London up to Yorkshire, I've fallen in love with gardening as I reached my 50s. And uh, but I'm, I'm drawing lots of analogies from it with teaching and learning, you know, growing over time, the journey, you know, regular water, water and routines and things. Uh, I'm, I'm clutching at straws here. But yeah, you're right. It's all about routines and consistency, I think, for anyone, regardless of how long you've been teaching. Um, in your role as a research lead, Jenny, um, what kind of things does that involve? So I know there'll be a lot of people listening, thinking, oh, I'd love to get involved with that. Or I want to work in a school that's research informed. Um, what, what kind of things does that aspect of your job entail? There are a few different strands, really, the way I see it. The, the primary goal of, of my primary goal, <laughs> the way I see that role, because it can be a bit of a, it can mean different things in different places. Um, but for me, it's about using what we know through things that have been published and um, kind of any other resources we've got to make the absolute best use of our resources. So, for example, from a leadership perspective, if we want to implement a new strategy, which is going to, you know, take time and resources and kind of energy, um, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we know, first of all, before we decide to go down that route, if there's anything available in the ether that will tell us whether that's a good idea or a bad idea or something we should tweak. So essentially, I do quite a lot of literature reviews to figure out whether things that my senior colleagues want to do um, and just make sure that we're making the most of what's out there. So that that's that's really important, I think. Mm -hmm. A lot of schools waste a lot of time doing things that actually if they'd done the reading they might not have tried in the first place or they could have made a minor tweak and it would have worked a lot better um the other thing is to make sure that staff are enabled to engage with research in a really meaningful way so that has to go beyond just having a book club which you mm -hmm. know a few teaching and learning geeks get excited about it's about making sure that the teaching staff have the language and the understanding that they need to engage with um, research informed practice in a way that's meaningful for them because not everybody mm -hmm. wants to read a book not everybody wants to do all of that stuff what they need some people is they just want to be in the classroom and they just want you to filter down the stuff that's really useful for them in a way that's mm -hmm. practical and i think that that's that's what makes the best edu books and blogs it's mm -hmm. making things practical and useful because most in most classroom teachers are not actually that bothered about all the stuff mm -hmm. that's going on behind it so you need to have people who are bothered so the teaching learning team at my school you know we have lead teachers who in, in, engage in this stuff as well and it's really important that in my role it's about making research accessible visible and have impact and that isn't about like, confusing people and throwing loads of terminology about it's about making sure that the stuff we've decided is a priority is done in the best possible most effective way sure sounds like a it's a it's one role i mean i was pretty much doing it in my my teaching experience but un, undefined i suppose uh going back 10 15 years so it's it's probably a, a an explicit teacher job description i would have loved to have had mm. now um given that the world's not shiny all of the time and even in our phenomenal schools there are some difficulties and if i could have a little chip at your rock and try and knock a little chip off your shoulder i suppose in your role leading teaching and learning of others, we know not everything's rosy. So I guess just for listeners who might be in a similar school to you or really struggling, I'm sure you have some difficult moments. And I suspect you'll have some staff that just aren't bothered with CPD here or there. You know, we all go through different moods, life gets in the way, those types of things. Could I just get you to unpick maybe some difficult moments you've had, some real challenges, maybe not going into too specific details no. or names, but just gen in general? So yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want any listeners for a moment to think that this is all rosy because I'm quite an upbeat person and I'm quite <laughs> like, I'm either, I'm either all, all in or not at all. So that that's just my kind of my personality, I suppose. It's a really challenging job. And I think that mm -hmm. the most difficult thing about teaching and learning is often that People who lead teaching and learning, myself included, are often the really enthusiastic, creative ideas people who have a vision, but they're not necessarily the detail process, seeing things through people, because often those people aren't the same people. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, the biggest challenge in my day to day role is making sure that I 
keep hold of the thing that I need to achieve rather than going new project, new project, new project, new project, shiny ball, shiny ball, shiny ball. Here's another mm -hmm. thing that I can get interested in and will distract me. And I think that what's really important is that you're able at points, you know, I was leading on a whole school initiative a couple of years ago and it was a really, it was massively challenging when I got to a point where I was like, do you know what? I've run with this and all my energy cannot propel this any further because mm -hmm. what I haven't done is think about the processes and the, 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 the kind of the systems that need to be in place to make this work. Mm -hmm. I think starting being able to reflect on the things that you think, well, it should work because I did all the research and I did all the CPD. So why isn't it working now? And actually being able to go, do you know what? I need to go and see a colleague who really has an eye for detail and figure out why this isn't working. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm quite lucky in my current place. I have a couple of colleagues who are absolutely fantastic at that kind of granular detail. Logistics. Implementation. Yeah. Like, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And they know what I'm like and I know what they're like. And so I regularly... Yeah for their oversight and they regularly come to me and say have you thought about this um because mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't think you have and i think that that's it's really really important to recognize when you're leading teaching and learning that really teaching learning is everybody's job it sounds, yeah. sounds, good, sounds cheesy but yeah. it really is so yeah, it's true you need people people around people around you don't you like exactly all those yeah. people need to have um a piece of that pie and really your job isn't to own it and to be possessive about it it's about being part of a really functional team um, sure yeah great i get it uh, it's, it's nice to hear someone articulate it um for me um now c we're recording this during covid at the back end of uh what's been probably the oddest well last year included but probably this full year of going through the pandemic the oddest year on history um now, workload and i suppose it is for most people leading teaching and learning also trying to make that job easier for teachers um if we could try and take out a covid aspect to the issue what what is the current workload issue in a phenomenal school is it still marking is it something different to be honest i think i think workload it becomes a problem when you stop thinking about it so i would say that at the moment so obviously things like teacher assessed grades and all the covid specific things we've had to do mm -hmm. mental mm -hmm. And we've had to respond and react to things as they've come up. Yeah. What I would say is that work really sensible workload balance in a school is achieved when every decision you make considers workload in a meaningful way. And you're balancing um, whether this will have impact on students, which is commensurate with the amount of additional workload for teachers. So if it's going to have this much impact for students, but it's going to have this much impact on workload, it's not worth doing because you will inevitably have a negative impact on students because the teachers are, are stressed so mm -hmm. i think that it's very very easy to go we've got a workload charter we've done that that's great our workload is really good now let's just crack on with the real business and then you lose track of the fact that all of a sudden the workload stuff is creeping up again because it never stops and no. so that's what i mean i'll return to that thing about service-based leadership constantly reviewing what are we doing what are we asking the t staff to do is this okay you know i had a I had a really um heartfelt conversation with my line manager who's the vice principal for teaching and learning who is absolutely brilliant and she's devastated that we've had to scrap loads of cpd plans this year because yeah. she's made the right decision that you know what right now what staff need is time to do all this ridiculous paperwork and moderation for year 11 mm. teacher grades and as much as we value cpd and we value all of that stuff do you know what it's gonna have to wait until september because mm. we can't do that meaningfully and look after our staff at the same time and so really like it's about an ongoing commitment to we're going to ask this question of ourselves all the time and we're going to ask the question every time we decide to implement a new policy is it worth the workload is the impact worth the workload and do you know what sometimes we will introduce something that's really high workload because the impact yeah. is massive and that's it's got a but but then you've got to sell it to the staff and you've got to make sure everyone's on board and you know as an example we're literally about to introduce a booklettized curriculum so we've been we've been trialing it this year it's been really successful staff are being um trained it's all kind of and we're doing it in sensible stages and there are lots everyone knows what the roadmap is there are lots of dates and deadlines and people understand mm -hmm. doing it reasonably but the workload is considerable but we mm -hmm. believe that in the long term it's going to have a positive impact on workload and on students and therefore mm -hmm. it's worth it 
so it's about saying this is rock hard but we're going to do it anyway because we think it's the right thing and we're going to sell it to staff properly and they're going to have ownership and therefore it's it's okay so it's not that you never do something because people are going to get stressed about it it's that you make the right choices about the right things sure uh, i'm i'm really inspired by what you say and you talk very fast which is good Sorry, because it's it, so fast <laughs> it, no well i'm scottish and so we talk even faster uh, but uh, i'm inspired by that with the, all the energy and as you're talking away i'm thinking right how do you learn to bite your lip uh, really? you know in those yeah in those leadership you meetings how, how, how good are you at keeping your mouth shut it's a constant battle not gonna lie so <laughs> i what's interesting is that over the course of my career i've sort of developed an understanding about this so if i can be really serious for a moment i think that one of the things that is very challenging so i'm, I'm an ethnic minority woman so i'm i'm mixed race i'm quarter caribbean you can't really tell that i'm, mm -hmm. I'm mixed race i look a bit italian maybe i don't know greek something like that quite dark coloring and curly hair but the my you know i was raised by a caribbean woman and mm -hmm. her caribbean sisters and my kind of my family on that side and culturally i'm very loud i gesticulate all the time i kind of talk over people because that's what i've been raised to do that's sure, how yeah. we communicate and that's not about being rude or ignorant that's a cultural difference with how people communicate in different kind of in different kind of ethnic groups essentially mm -hmm. and that's totally fine um and totally civilized in that context and the issue is that not everybody thinks like that and that for a long time in my career, I felt very much like I've had to sort of shrink that part of myself and mm -hmm. bite my lip and sit down and just be quiet. And as much as that kind of that, that's been an instructive experience for me, because I think it's put me in situations in previous schools where I felt very much that I've been not bringing my full self to the table. Mm -hmm. and that's a problem for the organization because i'm great but a problem for me because i'm not happy and i don't feel that i'm being listened to and i have to learn that my colleagues are fantastic and i need to sit and listen and listen to hear them not listen to reply because that's what i do mm -hmm. um so i work really hard at making sure i listen to my colleagues and i give everyone space and i'm quiet and then do you know what's really important is that I also, you know, for myself is that I'm listening so that I can actually make informed comments because sometimes I just go, blah, 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 I think this or I've already worked yeah. out. So it's genuinely been a bit of a like, it's genuinely it sounds like a real journey in terms of your lead leadership development, as well as your own identity and fitting in with leadership team, I guess, you know, a lot of personalities around the table as well. Yeah. And, and that's, and I'm starting, the thing I'm really starting to understand, certainly at this school is that I have some very talented senior colleagues who are genuinely phenomenal at their jobs and I'm watching them and I'm learning a lot from these people who all are completely themselves. They're really proud of who they are and where they're from and their identity and they all have a very, very clear sense of self and I feel as though I can be fully myself with these people and they they respect me and they see what I bring to the table. Good. They well, that's good. Well, well, you know, you're in a happy school then if that, if yeah, that's the yeah, case. Thing. Yeah. Good. Right. I want to switch to your books. So, uh, you know, I'm having a nose through your website and you've got a uh, very English specific books and uh, you, I don't know if we can talk about your new book. That's a secret, I suppose, but I'll let you make that call. But we want to talk about the metacognition book, the one that you're writing with, with another publisher. Oh yeah. yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so can you give listeners a general overview in terms of what, what you've published so far, reasons why, uh, and, and what you're getting out of that process? Yeah, so um, I wrote a book in 2018 called How to Teach English Literature, Overcoming Cultural Poverty. And it's essentially a bit of a manual for English teachers on how to teach English literature in a really challenging, robust way. I think the key thing for me with that book was that, I mean, if you're an English teacher, you kind of be aware. Often we... Um, often we make the mistake of dumbing things down, I think, with literature. Mm -hmm. Dare I say it? So I would advocate. Yeah, I'm shocked. <laughs> I advocate things like um, teaching the most challenging stuff early on in Key Stage Three, in teaching literary theory as early as possible, um, in making sure that we are having we have a really really kind of high challenge, knowledge rich curriculum because students have to write from a place of knowledge. They can't write mm -hmm. an essay on a fellow if they have had like a discovery based curriculum and they've just read the play and thought th talked about their feelings. They need to understand context. They need to understand form. They need to understand genre. They need to understand all of that stuff. So I'm a big advocate of, um, yeah, 
high challenge being really really academic and unapologetic about it um so that book is uh for english teachers and there is a book from 2019 called teach like mm -hmm. a writer which essentially addresses one of the biggest challenges for english teachers because basically the majority of english teachers are literature specialists not language specialists and most english teachers are not writers writing is an art form so mm -hmm. it would you know it's the equivalent of expecting um you know, an art teacher to be teaching um, all of the theory around art history in its entirety from year mm. seven, as well as the skills of, of creating art, because that's sure. exactly what we do, you know. Um, and so that book basically has lots of contributions from professional writers from a range of different disciplines um, in kind of political speeches and short stories and poetry and drama and all mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And basically they've all written a bit of a, this is a bit of an essay about their process and how they write and what what their form is all about and then i've kind of backed it up with lots of kind of practical teacher things about what people can do in the classroom um right. yeah and then the most recent I've, i have a macbeth revision guide which speaks for itself and then there's a most recent one is on metacognition um yes and it's the metacognition handbook it came out a couple of weeks ago and that is um all about metacognition. <laughs> so let's let's talk about that one because um, this is going to be the focus. Um, now I know when I've talked to teachers about metacognition or even retrieval practice, they go, "What's that?" Without really realizing that they already know it. It's just maybe not been unpicked or defined. So what is metacognition? Yeah, you're completely right. It's it's a lot of it is something that teachers already do naturally because we in we have a real intrinsic knowledge that that is how learning happens anyway so essentially mm -hmm. metacognition is about understanding how you learn and using that knowledge to learn better um mm -hmm. and then using that knowledge to kind of sustain that learning into the future so in order to um teach metacognitively you have to have a good foundational understanding of cognition how we um how the brain kind of embeds information in long term how skills develop over time how we build mm -hmm. schema, how we strengthen kind of those neural connections and all those kinds of things that's really important you need to have that as a foundation um but once you have that metacognition really is about making sure that you frame your teaching with um metacognitive framework which essentially is a series of questions for me and the book kind of talks about those um but it's about students understanding before they start a piece of work that they have to sort of activate prior knowledge and understand sort of what what is this task have i done this task before what's it mm -hmm. asking do how is this similar or different to something i've done in the past um what would be the you know when i've done it before what was successful should i do that again should i avoid mm -hmm. that did i learn something kind of coming up with a plan for how they're going to tackle something and then while they're doing that work they're able to self-regulate so they're they're checking themselves they're thinking um am i going along the right path or have i gone off on a tangent is this what i'm mm -hmm. supposed to doing so they're consciously aware of what they're doing and making mm -hmm. sure they sort of regulate as they go and then afterwards they're thinking about what they've done how successful they've been how they felt about it that's really important an element of metacognition which is often sort of overlooked i think in the classroom because it's hard is thinking about motivation so students self-efficacy their belief that they can achieve something is a really really important factor in their willingness to do something and so you know it's all well and good having a school behaviour policy which is flawless and students who will just do what you've asked. But whether or not they really, really believe that they can achieve something genuinely has an impact mm -hmm. on how well they perform. And so mm -hmm. um, there's a difference between compliance and engagement, you know? Of course. Um, yeah. So metacognitive learners are ones who are able to make the absolute best use of their brain and its power, I think, mm -hmm. is the best way to put it. So fascinating. Can can you unpick some of the sources of inspiration, some research articles yeah, yeah. for people? I mean, obviously, people will want to buy the book, but where did you draw your experience from? Obviously, the classroom. Uh, yeah, your so most of this is, it was certainly propelled by my interest in metacognition. I'm, I'm just, I'm really fascinated by cognition. Um, really, mm -hmm. really, really interested by kind of the learning process and, and how, um, how, cognition can be applied in the classroom to kind of essentially have greater gains if students understand all that stuff and how that works it genuinely mm -hmm. has a massive impact on them as learners but um i've been fascinated by metacognition for years um i did a project on metacognition when i was an ast um and have kind of been trialing um things for about eight or nine years i would say in the classroom but mm -hmm. in order to prepare for this book 
in kind of I probably spent a couple of years reading lots and lots of things um obviously a, a really really good place to start for anyone will be the eef guidance report on metacognition self-regulated learning um i really love the work of tova michalski um which is all referenced in the book um there's a chapter which goes through all the research and some mm-hmm. little stories so people can have a reading a place to start but tova michalski um came up with a really fantastic questions framework um he calls it connect comprehend Oh, strategize, reflect, um, which is excellent. Um, okay, we'll like, have a look and add a link to yeah. that. Okay. Um, and then, you know, people like Wynne, um, there are lots of really, um, just really, really interesting theorists in the mm-hmm. area. Um, and there's just tons and tons of really interesting research that's come out in the last sort of 10 years. Because yeah. a lot of people for a long time believed that metacognition was only really possible in older age groups, but tons of research, particularly coming out of the States in early years and things like that, mm. found that metacognitive traits and self-regulation you can see it in kind of early mm-hmm. years. you can see that in reception age children i see that in my own son you know any time when a child is is looking at something that they're having to do and recognizing while they're doing it that there's perhaps mm-hmm. a better way of doing it and changing so, their behavior that's self-regulation yeah so i bet you're going through a, a very interesting incarnation i suppose because you're a, a new parent relatively um you're a secondary experience you're writing books so i suspect you're in demand to share your wisdom with others outside of your school teach meets etc and lots of online conferences and having your own young children switching on that metacognition for a primary lens yeah <laughs> i guess you i guess you got a lot of light bulbs pinging away in your head so i, I have I, I to try and refine this to a question how, how are you managing navigating metacognition in a primary world in a, in a secondary classroom you know so as a primary parent uh how do you see this evolving as a as a teacher stroke parent in your understanding of how we learn I think that's a, a good enough question to begin with. And then I'll ask you another one about CPD. So let's start with that one, yeah. so first I'm, of all. I'm in a really privileged position, actually, because when I was a head of English, it was in an all-through school. And so I've right. seen the whole progress from okay, good. Um, pre-reception, so we used to get them in at three years old, all the way through to upper sixth. Um, mm. And that, and ab- it was absolute privilege to see that, that journey all the way through. And I think that there's a... In that sense, I think... The, the key thing I took from that was that learning is learning and the brain is the brain. And yes, there are differences cognitively between the kind of the stages of learning that the brain is at. So the way the brain takes on information and the way the brain focuses mm-hmm. on different things at different ages does change. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's quite a predictable change, actually. It's a really interesting, um, interesting set of reading you could do on that. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, it, um, but it's, I, yeah, I had a, for the book, I've got a, uh, my, Pro, uh, prologue? Prologue? It's not a prologue. I've just been teaching Romeo and Juliet. My <laughs> slide. Um, the bit before, the forward. Um, the forward, yeah. Written by Peps McRae, who's amazing. But yeah, I know Peps, yeah. was written by a neurosurgeon called Louise Saukila, who is absolutely okay. phenomenal. I was lucky enough to go to uni with her. She's an absolute legend, but she's doing research into paediatric tumours for the... Um, the for cancer research uk and she works at great ormond street on the weekend right. right uh doing neurosurgery on children she's a pediatric wow. neurosurgeon. she's absolutely amazing but she wrote me a forward which essentially talks about how there is a lot that we know about the brain and about how the brain is kind of receptive to learning different things at different times and so i think there's a certainly an element of primary specialism that is absolutely critical mm-hmm. you know I think a lot of secondary school teachers make the mistake of thinking that they could do primary because it's easy and it's really not. Mm -hmm. Um, It's rock hard. There is is a huge amount of specialism. However, um, in terms of kind of, I I do think that there there are a lot of similarities because again, you know, teaching is teaching and the brain still learns things in the same way. Um, And I think that, I think that there's a lot we can learn from mm-hmm. primary in terms of. Yeah, no, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of all through schools. There's lots of good, yeah. uh, good evidence. I, I can't remember the count exactly, but there's probably a good 170 schools across England that are all through. And you know, no surprise that they don't have a year six, tra- uh, year seven transition slump. Um, teachers yeah. are blended between classrooms. Kids get to experience the kind of big classroom spaces and specialist teachers earlier on. Um, I guess given what you know about metacognition and given curriculum reform, it's a big question. Do you think our schools are 
in terms of a timetable, you know, 60 minute lessons, uh, you know, given all the pressures that we have to do curriculum and kids moving around schools, do you think 60 minute lessons support metacognitive learning? Yeah. Um, if I'm honest, uh, I have taught in a school that had 100 minute lessons before and it was dreadful. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's sensible at all. I think that I don't. So I think the reason for that is that, of course, I would like to have my students for four hours, right, in a beautiful, lovely, long sequence of learning English and never stopping. However, um, that's not helpful for them, I don't think. And I think there's only so much that they can take in and they need to process things over time. Mm -hmm. I think sure. that it's really, really useful to have smaller chunks because those smaller chunks allow for lots and lots of meaningful retrieval and those kinds of things there. They are literally interspaced. Mm -hmm and interleaving their retrieval by going to different lessons every day but of i also course. think that if you're planning lessons in hour-long sequences and you're doing a bad job it's and it's probably worse for your, your workload don't plan like that i plan a sequence of lessons which i deliver over a number of periods which are truncated you know and i think that that's mm -hmm. probably the best way to think about it if you're planning individual lessons i said it before you don't learn something in an hour you don't learn something in a lesson you learn something over a complex sequence of cognitive events which the teacher mm -hmm. facilitates you know so don't yeah i won't worry about it i don't actually care how how long your lessons are it's, it's really yeah it's that it's that context of chunking isn't it and then dividing that into your stage and age and subject etc now, Jenny, we are we've broken our kind of barrier for my succinct podcast because we're having such a good time talking about teaching and learning. So I'm going to move the conversation forward into my uh, kind of my kind of retrieval quiz type uh, method in terms of all our conversations. So I'll start easy, and you can't pause or hesitate. I don't think you'll have a problem, but let, let me okay. see if I can, let me see if I can catch you off guard. So uh, give me a, a project that's on your desk at school. What, what are you working on? Uh, reading. Uh, okay. Lots of reading, cross curricular reading. Okay, the next question was give me one book that you are reading. Uh, the Girl of Ink and Stars. I'm reading it for Year Seven Transition. <laughs> okay, why funky pedagogy? Uh, because I, well, I still do, but at the time I came up with a Twitter handle, I was singing in a funk band. Right, great. <laughs> and I just love music. <laughs> and, and obviously on the bassoon. Uh, I mean, I play the bassoon like orchestrally. I say I play. Okay. I picked up my bassoon about two years. But, right, um, well, there you yeah, go. Yeah, I, I sing. I um, give me one thing uh, last academic week that you were firefighting. Oh. Oh, oh, the sample, year 11 sample. Um, <laughs> but it was great. But and it's done. But basically, yeah. this is a dreadful story. We had a power cut, right? So AQA, thank you know, gave us forty eight hours. Forty eight hours, hours yeah. In, you know, twenty seven or something. And then you had a power cut. Um, and then we had a power cut, so we couldn't. We had to scan in all of these English language folders that are like forty pages each. We had to scan them into the photocopier, and we wouldn't let anyone else do it because we needed, like, me and the vice principal were like scanning all these things in. And then the power cut happened. It was an absolute madness. <laughs> we stayed until like almost seven o'clock. Oh the no! TV. What a story! <laughs> like Poor scanning you. all the things, but it was great. It was fine. It was all fine. Lots <laughs> of coffee. Um, if I came to Wakefield, I have been there once recently since my move up north. But where would we go? Where would we take me? Uh, uh, where would we go for chips and gravy? So actually, I live in Leeds, and oh, I right, okay, my apologies. <laughs> needs to be definitely needs to be rectified. However, the Hepworth Gallery is in Wakefield, and it's absolutely amazing. Um, chips right, and gravy in Wakefield, there. no idea, but you could definitely go to Canters on Chapel Town Road in Leeds. Whoop. Okay, the shout out. Um, piece of advice <laughs> for a teacher wanting to engage with research. Start small. Don't think you have to read all the books at once. Like literally just start with something really simple. I would actually go to the EEF website, choose one report, read the guidance report and then follow some of their recommended mm -hmm. reading because there Good is a tip. lot out there and a lot of there it's is. There is. There yeah. is. Um, now, Shimi, you're doing your dream job, but what, what was that wacky career you never had? Oh, oh, I don't know. Wacky career I never had. So I'm, I'm married to a professional musician. So like he right. kind of has a wacky career and does all the performances and stuff. Okay. not <laughs> um, No deep sea diver in you or anything like that, no? Nah, I'm not that interested. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what's your kind of biggest uh, career achievement you're most proud of to date? Do you know what? This is a funny one. I negotiated my job 
and job description and salary while breastfeeding. Like oh, in a meeting amazing. with a baby. And do you know what? Like that's for me, that's massive. And yeah, I think it's huge. That's, that's great. Talk about for women in general. Yeah, no, I, I've been there in, in, a, in a situation like that. And it's uh, it's fabulous that our uh, organizations can embrace that type of stuff. Not everywhere, but uh, it's good to hear. Um, who would you recommend I interview next and why? Now, we know David recommended Ooh. you. Okay. So who would, who would yours Ooh. be? Interview Hailey Hughes. Hailey Hughes, yes. I've, I've just connected with Hailey, actually, so we'll get in touch. Yeah. Okay, great. And why? She's, she's just so clever. She's had such an interesting career so far. Like, she was a Fleet Street journalist and, and kind of for, for a serious, like, for the sun or something. Like, she... She's right. had such an interesting career, but she's also just fascinating. She's doing a PhD in something really cool. She's, yeah. you know, brought out millions of books and is just high energy and brilliant. And she, she is okay. I'll get in touch. Do another fantastic job. So I would highly recommend her. She's hilarious as well. Yeah. Right. I will get in touch with Haley. Okay. What was, uh, what will be your next blog post title? Oh God, no idea. Oh, I'm about to post a couple of um, Amplify, Amplify blogs. So I have guest bloggers who are like women who don't have a platform yet. So um, mm -hmm. I've got a couple of those to come on. This okay, week. nice. Uh, what advice would you give your 16 year old self? Keep on trucking. You're doing great. And don't straighten your hair, fool. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, here's a big question. Uh, what would you hope to be your legacy? Oh, I just hope my kids are like nice, you know, I want my boys to go out there and be like a positive force on the world and to not be, I'm not going to swear. Um, yeah, I know first. what you mean. You know what I mean? Not be one of those. Um, that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, juice or gravy? What do you prefer? Gravy. <laughs> and gravy. gravy. Well, the, gravy. The, the Northern gravy. Sun. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> Jenny, where can listeners find out more about you? Online, blogs, links, uh, that type so of stuff? My website, funkypedagogy.com, will give you everything you need to know. There's like events calendar and resources and blog and all that stuff on there. And Twitter, at Funky Pedagogy. Of course. Yeah. So, Jenny, it's been... Uh, it's been a blast, actually. I've really enjoyed it. It's been high energy. I uh, really enjoyed our conversation about teaching and learning. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all the amazing work that you do in the teach your community online, sharing all your wisdom. And it's wonderful to hear just such good energy that there are some brilliant schools out there doing some incredible things. And we can, in difficult circumstances, uh, get it right and support our teachers. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me.